No one supports women better than me. Well, I mean, it really depends on what your definition of supports means, President Clinton. If you haven't already, go ahead, like, share, subscribe to the channel, ring that bell below anytime we have something. You will be among the first to know. Episode 5 is here. We're at the halfway mark of Impeachment American Crime Story. Uh, this one is called Do You Hear What I Hear? Sort of a play on... This is the Impeachment Christmas episode where um, we're playing on the old Christmas carol of the same name. Because Linda Tripp is so enamored with Christmas and it's sort of... Where would normally be a happy time with Christmas, sort of all engulfed on this very tense and, and juicy uh, episode of sort of the calm before the proverbial storm when just shit just starts hitting all types of fans. The cold open is sort of gave you the line that President Clinton, played by Clive Owen, gives here in this episode. And it's really the only time we really get President Clinton in this episode. He is more of the boogeyman that is happening in the background while... This is very much a Beanie and Sarah show as Linda and Monica. Um, but I bring it up because there's the... Uh, it's an interesting stance that President Clinton plays in this where um, he is sort of going over or, or a trial version of what the deposition may be for him. And he's getting asked these questions that get pretty personal that he doesn't... He gets agitated to answer. Um, knowing... His, his age sort of lets him know that Paula is going to get this exact same thing. And he even brings up, like, this should be being asked to Paula, not to me. And they're like, no, we're going to handle Paula, but you're going to get asked this type of stuff too, so you need to be prepared. And one of his advisors sort of lets slip, because he mentions they didn't do this to Kennedy, because Kennedy is known to have had many, many extramarital affairs. Um, and the aide lets slip that this, that this is in the 60s, like things are changing. <laughs> we're we're moving up towards a, a positive moment, and Clinton's sort of warped brain, um, at least in this episode, maybe for dra dramatization. But in this, he just rattles off a list of all the women that he has employed in his cabinet. He's like, I do that. This person, this person, this person, this person just starts shooting them out, shooting them out, which is great. He is on one hand doing something that is great for women. He, he by following that up, he says. No one supports women more than me. Which is a take. Sure. Um, but clearly, his brain is separating women that he has put in business that he does not have any type of a, an attraction or sexual uh, appetite for versus the women that he can pray and, and, and manipulate and move as he wants. So... It's a problematic feminist. He's like, I'm putting women in power, but I'm also abusing the shit out of them on the other side. Um, shows you how, how where we were in the 90s and where we've come now and see if there's been any growth between, yeah, I'm doing this on my left hand, but I'm doing this with my right hand that you can't see. It's, it's, it's a dirty way of, of doing things and it's just showing you the two-sidedness of, uh, of President Clinton. Um, and sort of the issues that goes with the complicated man that he was. And that's sort of all we, that we get with the Clinton side of it. Before I get into the Linda and Monica of the episode, which pretty much takes up the, the rest of the remaining episode, there's a Paula Jones to it all. Paula is out with Susan, and her mom shows up. And her mom, you can tell, is someone who really cares about her daughter, but there's very much from a small, indescri indescribable town. Uh, of probably a, a population of 500. Um, that is what people who drive and do all these things realize it's not that big of a distance, but her mother lets her know that 30 minutes is a far distance to be driving <laughs> for this. But she comes to see her daughter and she immediately gets the mother binders, the, mo the mother signals on to saying that something's not right here. And saying, I heard that you were offered in a settlement. But she starts looking at Susan that I don't think she has what's best for my daughter in mind. And Steve's not here present, so I feel like mom has already probably felt a way about him as well. But in this, she's not she's not feeling Susan. And once Susan goes away to sort of get the, the reservations sort of set, 
mom kind of just says, you need to watch her. And Paula, well, I got this, mama. I'm going to be fine. I got people looking out for me. But she really doesn't. She is so naive to all of this that she's got people who are looking out for her who are not looking out for her best interest. They're looking out to make a name for themselves off of her back. And unfortunately, they have not, they have not set her up or made her fully aware of what all is about to take place versus if you had just taken a settlement and not saying that's the way she should have gone. But if you knew everything that was on the table, I think she may have gone a different way because the next thing that Paula has, she is in her deposition. And they're grilling her. Uh, the same person who's going through the, the, the deposition trial with, with President Clinton is now going through the actual one with Paula. And he, like he said, he's, going to, he's prepared to destroy her and go through it, and he, and he is. And they start first asking her about President Clinton specifically. Did you have sex with him? Did you do this? Did you do that? And they go into the minutia of it all. And she's like, no, I didn't do that and all that good stuff. But they sort of trick her up. And uh, they, in a roundabout way, they ask her, was she, is she a doctor? Or has she been with enough men to sort of use these men as a deciphering measure of what she considers to be a small penis versus a large penis. Because in her deposition or in her testimony, she has said that President Clinton had a small penis and a, and a U-hook and all of that stuff. So they can see that if, she, if she's going to be that specific with that, then she, needs to, she would have had a litany of male suitors to sort of judge this on and they just start running through the gamut stuff of people who have lied now that she's a popular figure that they have, they have lied they've gotten gotten gathered all these names um and they'll use one name that she does know like yeah i know him um and it's at a party and she's like no nah, i didn't i didn't have sex with him but there's nothing really he chased he said she said situation and so they're trying to discredit her they start that person is sort of just creating the story and started piling up other names that Really, Paula has nothing to do other than say, no, I didn't do that, and gets a little flustered because she just starts feeling attacked about her character and her name. She was not prepped for that, clearly. Susan is so concerned with the, the publicity and all of that that her lawyers and who she has around her, because Susan's not in, the, in that room with her now, they didn't set her up. Set her up for failure. And it was sort of... It was sad to see someone who as who is as innocent and naive as Paula Jones just get just eviscerated, like thrown to the wolves. Um, and that's just a small microcosm of what we all know, if you're cognizant of this era, all know that Monica and to an extent Linda are about to go through. Um, so mama, mama was right. You need to watch it back. You should have probably, if this is not a road that you wanted to go through, Paula probably should have, would have been in the best interest for her to take the settlement and not listen to Steve who now in current day, we know she's not with with him. And then we get into the Linda and the Monica, the all juicy part of the episode, um, where it gets really uncomfortable with people who consider who one considers them to be a friend. And Linda, in a weird way, probably does too. But she feels that the truth and justice of of downing that man, that problematic man, is worth more than what is her friendship with Monica. And so we get a lot of Monica saying that, hey, I've got, I'm, now, I'm now on a witness list. And I met, um, I guess there's another sequence with, with President Clinton. Monica does actually go to see him um, later. We don't that in a moment. But Monica lets Linda know that, hey, I'm on this witness list. And I don't know how I got there. I don't know how they got my name. But... Uh, I think you, I just want to let you know that. And for a while there, Linda's not letting her know that she also has been subpoenaed, that she's been subpoenaed and that she's on that list. And so this is game of cat and mouse where she's not letting Monica know all the things that are happening on this thing for protection or whatnot. There's this opening, this cold open for this episode is very, it, it, it's, it's a little conniving. Um, but basically Monica has a job interview with Revlon uh, and um, Monica has decided that she wants to wear the blue dress that has the, the, the famous, the infamous blue dress that has the stain on it. And Linda calls her literary agent and <laughs> literary agent friend who have gotten into some trouble, um, but calls her to say, hey, 
the dress is about to get cleaned. I don't know what to do. And they're like, you cannot let that dress get cleaned. That's going to be a thing. And so Linda sets it up, originally calling Monica to say, hey, you don't want to have that dress cleaned. What if you need to use that for any type of DNA? I watched the OJ case. You may, you may, this may come back that you want to get that DNA used for, for uh, identification and all that stuff. And Monica's like, well, why would I want to do that? I'm not telling my name. And that should have been a red flag for her as a child. She probably just didn't realize it, but just that just doesn't seem right because none of that matters. I, I, I shouldn't have to do that. But... She did, she kind of just questioned, like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, I, I'm going to wear the dress. This dress makes me feel good and look good. And so Linda sees that the tactic that she was using, she has to change on the fly. And the DNA of it all, they're keeping it for preservation purposes. Ain't going to cut it. She ain't following that. So she basically is just like, yeah, you don't look that damn good in that dress. And that's the easy way for a young girl who is already suffering with some type of body images. Good friend there, Linda. It's like, hey. You might not want to wear that dress because I don't think you look that good. But that peach one, that's good. And so she wind, winds up playing this Iago type of Shakespearean character where she gets Monica to believe that, yeah, I want to keep the blue dress. And so she does. And we, we see where that comes down, down the line. Eventually at the mall while Christmas shopping, Monica gets out of Linda that Linda has been subpoenaed to. And she has to uh, appear in court. And Monica's like, well, we got to get our story straight. We got to... I'm signing that, David. I'm, not, I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm not saying that this anything happened. You need to do that exact same thing, because in all of this, every time that President Clinton has asked Monica about this, Monica, he knows Monica's not going to stay. And he knows that Monica's going to lie, and that he's got her in the bag, and he's got his fixer to get her a job out in New York and Red Line to get her to lie and then get her to shut up, and we don't have to worry about her perjury. She's fine. What wasn't taken into account is how much information that was given to Linda. And here's the thing. Uh, if it was just Linda and Monica's word, Monica's affidavit versus Linda's affidavit probably would be a wash. And they were like, well, if the actual person who is saying it, um, that they didn't have an affair and who's being accused of having it, if she doesn't say it, they're fine. It's the tapes. The recordings are what basically does all of this in. There's actual proof that has been put on on on, uh, on tape tons and tons of time to sort of prove prove this. Uh, unfortunately, for Linda, Linda sort of gets a rude awakening and the FBI and the agents are like, e these tapes can't be, they're not admissible. Like her lawyer is like, I can't do anything with these tapes. You get things away from me, uh, we, we're gonna have to find out the proper channels, but we can't do anything like this. And so she calls, calls her literary agent friend again, and she's like, uh, you told me that I would be fine. You told me that this was fine. I was like, oh, New York, you're good, but like some states, you're not. Um, and so she's now under, Linda's now under the gun of like, am I going to go to jail? Like, am I going to go to prison for recording all these tapes? Which she is, she should have. Like, she is, one, not only is she a bad friend, but she's also legally taping someone, not of not their, not their knowledge. It's into some dicey, dicey situations there. But, it starts getting circulated that those tapes exist between the FBI, between some, some news outlets, between some people who are doing this task force that's sort of meant to uh, take down Clinton, who the task force themselves, they're kind of like, we don't have anything. Like, there's literally nothing that we have to work with here. And if we took this to Capitol Hill, we would fail. And then these tapes sort of appear. And the legality of how to use these tapes, what sort of is now being passed around throughout a lot of this episode. The FBI kind of figures out a, a, a little back door to, to using these tapes or to allow, at least allow something to be brought up. So they get Linda to wear a wire to talk to Monica. Because at the very end of the day, if they can get something that they have, as a team, have put on us for a sting, it's different than if you're recording someone on a phone, it becomes somewhere, it, the legal, legal legion, it becomes uh, uh, admissible. And so they need Linda to do two things. They need Linda to get Monica to admit to uh, falsifying her affidavit and saying that she basically she perjured herself and saying that they did have an affair and she's going to lie and openly lie to her. And that Vernon Jones got her a job as a fixer to basically shut her up, to keep her, to keep her silent. And that's what the final sequence of this episode sort of deals with. 
Uh, and it's, it's tense because Linda's freaking out. She's got to she's wearing a wire. She's uncomfortable. There are moments of just the way that she looks. She, she knows what she's doing is filthy and dirty and grimy. And she's scared. She knows she has people watching. And Monica also sort of feels slight or, or, or uncomfortable. She thinks that there might be people watching. And she even says, like, get, get it together. Nobody's watching you. She feels like she talk, starts talking to Linda's purse when Linda goes off to the restroom to readjust her, her wire to just... She's concerned for her well-being. Um, not enough, I would say, because, yes, she was, in fact, being taped. Um, she is freaked out of her mind uh, because up until this point, Linda had been ghosting her. Um, anytime she would call, she could get a square answer. She was supposed to meet her lawyer several days ago, several weeks ago, and, and then they were going to meet back up, and she never did. So Linda's been playing this coy game with Monica, and this is sort of the... Probably the last sequence that we're really going to episode that we're going to really see the two of them together in any friendly manner. I think from here on out, shit's going to hit the fan, and uh, we're going to see their friendship break apart and uh, both of their lives break apart. There is an interesting sequence that I didn't really bring up that uh, the photo will be here. They do a good job of recreating that moment, but I guess. The photo that we've seen of Linda and Monica together, where Linda and Monica are smiling with the flag to the upper right corner, um, they sort of recreate that. It's her time right before she goes off to get her, take her red blonde job, which I think we can know that never really happens because all hell breaks loose. But that's that photo that they recreate here. And it's just, it's fun to see those brief moments that like, hey, that, actually, that photo actually exists or that moment actually exists and you can kind of see what they're wearing and match up. Well done to the costume department and kind of figuring out how everything comes together. All in all, a really, really good episode, an intense episode, an episode where um, you get into a little bit of the legalese of everything. There's a funny line that happens uh, given by Colin Hanks as the fixers are sort of, fixers and FBI folks are, are leaving Linda's place and they start hearing about the tapes. They leave, they're like, we got tapes. Like, this is bigger than Watergate. And Watergate had tapes. And they were like, oh, I was like, well, I'm glad we have the tapes. Because if we put her on the stand, meaning Linda Tripp, no one would like her. She's like, she is very unlikable as a person. And that made me laugh because I think that's sort of been the sentiment. Just so you, you see photos and you hear Linda and God rest of the dead. But she was not a very uh, uh, charismatic or likable person. But the one thing that she did put on this planet that uh, gave her any type of notoriety is recording someone illegally, which is just a grimy way to <laughs> make your name, get your name out there. We're at, like, again, I say we're at the halfway mark and they are doing some some, some some intense work here. I can't wait to see what happens next. There's just a little tidbits that we see from the episode. We see Beanie about to go into full berserk mode that her, the friend that she cared about is gone and she knows that her life is about to just turn upside down. Um, and it's going to be heartbreaking to see sort of her become, for those who were not around at that time, uh, as I was, sort of see her become the butt of the joke of America. Um, both, I mean, there's a, a man that she tries to date here. I don't know if, I don't know if this is just put in here for dramatic purposes, you know, but there was a person that she tried to date here at the top that seemed like it could go somewhere. But I think once all of this comes out, her name is attached to this. Could also be hard. It, it, it's funny because I didn't think about this, but in addition to having her life broken politically uh, as a job, granted social media didn't exist, but basically becoming the butt of the joke, she also might probably not getting anywhere um, in a relationship because it's going to be hard to for men, more a lot of men, to sort of separate her from that act or that situation and that powerful of a man. It's going to be a lot of people who's like, I can't compare to that. Which sucks. Um, it's going to be interesting to see the descent of that. We still didn't get Edie in this. No Edie Falcons, no Hillary in this one. Um, and I, I do, it doesn't seem like what we thought was going to happen in that episode was him going to tell Hillary. It seemed like he was just watching and, and seeing. I still don't quite know if she was made aware. I feel like she was, and she's just been kept quiet until all of this, and we don't really get Edie until the next few episodes. But if there's got, you don't get someone as potent as Edie Falco to play Hillary and not put her on the board more prominently. So there's got to be something coming up where uh, we start to get to see that angle get 
pull that a little bit more. But still loving it. It's still a great episode. These American Crime Stories are are, are one hundred percent the best thing that Ryan Murphy has done. Um, there's a fantastic beginning, middle, and end to these, and I can't wait to see what. Can't wait to finish this off, but I know he's got some American sports story coming with Aaron Hernandez. Like, this is sort of my bag, and uh, uh, it's just fantastic to watch from, from start to finish. What did you guys think about episode five? Do you hear what I hear of American Crime Story? Impeachment. Go ahead and leave your thoughts and comments in the comments below. If you haven't already, you can follow us on Twitter at Hollywood ADI. You can hit us up on email at HollywoodAlreadyDidIt at gmail.com. We also have a podcast with the same name. That's on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and here on YouTube. Anywhere that plays podcasts, we're there. Uh, we currently have our main episode, our main series of podcasts talking about Venom 2, but their recurrence, and then our Marvel pair-up spinoff uh, with guest host Jamie Jurek. We're talking about the What If episodes and pairing those up with a non-MCU canon feel. Uh, and this week was the Punisher series, multiple <laughs> multiple attempts at the Punisher. Uh, but you can find that also here and wherever else podcasts are played. But like always, I got my ticket. You got yours. <laughs>